into this beautiful circle of squares wherever you find yourself in the clock time of the day, the sunrise of this moment. Greetings to this land where we're sitting here in what was once tended by the Malaku people here in the Northern Caribbean slopes of Costa Rica. But we can keep admitting people as we greet. Um, yeah, my name is Lynn Murphy and Adam Westerland. And um, we're going to sit in this inquiry of what is uh, post capitalist learning, other ways of knowing, being, sensing, um, and the relevance to, to where we all find ourselves in this moment in relation to this beautiful inquiry of reimagining education. And I have, we um, are part of a project, kind of what we call a temporary autonomous organization <laughs> called the Transition Resource Circle. And um, it's essentially how do we find our ways in these moments of transitioning out of systems of exploitation and domination towards ones that honor life. Um, we often focus on those who have resources, the wealth holders themselves, because there's a deep sickness in hoarding money and the entire philanthropic NGO industrial complex. Just throw that out there. <laughs> Um, but the inquiry is beyond that as well. And the circle part is to, to find ourselves in circle ways, to find ourselves in ways that are guiding us, not just um, the human circles, but the more than human circles that can, can offer us guidance in these moments. So I um, felt to start just with a moment of... Um, Adam is a research fellow with us in Transition Resource Circle, and uh, my we my co-author and I, uh, Alnor Lada, we recently wrote a book called Post Capitalist Philanthropy: Healing Wealth in the Time of Collapse. And as I said, it's about a lot more than philanthropy. And I actually came to working on post capitalism and um, working on this topic from spending a couple decades working in and around the construct of the modern school and the alternative school movement for, for some decades. So that will come in in a moment. But I just wanted to speak to why we, we spoke about that second line of the book, post-capitalism and, and healing in the time of collapse. Um, we feel like where we are right now is in the, the age of consequence. Whether you want to look at the last 500 years that perhaps we can look at today of a certain kind of technology of the mind and the symbology that's often called the age of enlightenment that many of us would also see as kind of another version of the, the dark ages, the, the story of modernity, the story of late stage capitalism, the story of where we are in this last, last chapter of late stage capitalism, of neoliberalism. We are in this age of consequences that have been these forces at work for thousands of years that bring us into systems of domination and exploitation. And these systems are not just outside of ourselves, but they are actually within ourselves as well. And many would talk about this age of consequences as the, the meta crisis, looking at how we've crossed all these various planetary boundaries. And what is a commensurate response to this moment that we find ourselves in. Um, so this is kind of the, 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 the broadest and also into the, to the most intimate within ourselves way that we approach this inquiry on um, what is post-capitalist learning. In many ways, um, the first step to think about what an appropriate learning for our times would be to be a student at our times. And so that's why the centering on the framing. Um, where are we? Um, what would a reasonable response even be? And how would you think about um, unpacking this for yourself or other people um, to be contextually relevant? Um, so first, just situating ourselves in the time that we find ourselves in. 
there's a, a line we often say, which is, um, how do we become more contextually sensitive? So like locating ourselves in this moment and our entanglement of all of our relations um, to be more contextually relevant to this moment, whether you wanna call it the moment of the meta crisis, the poly crisis, the Kali Yuga, the Anthropocene, the, the many ways that we all recognize this, this like teetering, very potent moment that we find ourselves in. So if you um, will pardon me for a moment, I'm gonna put up a couple slides just as a, a visual to help guide us along for a moment here. And, um, and then we'll, we'll come back and we'll just put out some um, provocations and then have some time for, for discussions. So let's see, Ayo, would you go with their third and yeah. And it's on, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So this is just kind of where we are. So um, many of us who are here in this room know a lot about the history of schooling and how schools actually came from a uh, militarizing society, came from Prussia that were very much looking to inculcate people ever more into competition into those who would serve this moment of, of military, of extraction under the guise of citizens to serve what was then becoming the nation state. And, um, and then the, the industrialists from the US, from the UK, and I think a delegation from Argentina and maybe a couple other countries heard about this thing that was going on in Prussia. And so they went over to see it. And they were like, this is what we need. This is what we need to do to develop factory workers and those who would actually serve the logic of capitalism. So I'm not gonna go through that, that history. What I wanna point to is that that history even itself was embedded within a longer arc. You know, there's, there's the work of, of Jason Hickel and others who have shown us that there was a very intentional um, shifting out of non-dual, more animate ways of knowing and being that happened um, in the European context around 800 years ago. And, um, and that was very much used to justify um, the rationale of dehumanizing to justify the, the exploitation and, and genocide and enslavement. I want to just say that so when we invoke some of these memetic structures, these, these histories, and also used to, with the logic of thingifying the more than human realm, to thingify nature, it, to thingify the trees and the forests and the rivers, and continue this process of exerting our domination and power over. So you have this very intentional philosophical shift, this deep technology of mind, this deep ontological way of perceiving the world itself that predated that story of Prussia, that predates that story of um, the industrial revolution. And at the same time, you had, you know, the introduction of the printing press and other ways that introduced ever more a certain kind of literacy, a certain kind of way of knowing and being that was ever more in the realm of symbology and ever more lining up with a certain um, technology of mind that we would call rationality that then turned into positivism, that there is the way to know and it is through a certain way of logic. So what we're just gesturing towards here is the pyramid logic of the dominant system. We use the gateway of neoliberalism, this latest chapter of uh, capitalist modernity to show how this, the deep logic of the global neoliberal operating system, the very waters that we're swimming in, the very way that all of us have, we didn't ask to be born into this, this mode of, of late stage capitalism, this mode of how the, the, the ideological mimetic structures and these technologies of mind kind of keep us constrained and in certain cages. But yet here we are. 
And that all of the sectors, whether it be the, the logic of capitalism, whether it be one sector that we looked at, philanthropy, NGOs, modern schooling, et cetera, et cetera, are fractal nodes that replicate this pyramid logic. And that the, the institutions themselves are fractal nodes of that, even down to us as perceived individual actors of replicators. So the one that most of us who've had experience with something called schooling or the way that often education is used, we can just kind of simply talk for a moment about like <laughs> what my co-author and um, co-guider here, Alnor, often refers to as the holy trinity within this pyramid logic of separation, materialism, and rationality. And the separation is that I'm sitting here next to, to Adam at, a, at such a deep level, I am inculcated into a thought form, into a structure, into a way of perceiving reality itself that I am separate from, that I am an individual actor, separate from Adam, separate from this table, separate from the air in which even I'm taking in every moment, separate from this water that I may, that I may sip. And how deep this this ontological gaze, this way of, of seeing reality itself is, is lives within us and swims within our cultures and our institutions and the way that we approach this thing called it or the, this modality called education. The other piece of that Holy Trinity is, of course, materialism. And this is the one that suggests that everything can be reduced to its component parts and understanding the relationship of the parts might give us insights into causality or into relationship to the whole. There is the, the I would say, perhaps the hubris of the, the Newtonian physicists and some of even going into the quantum physicists to say we can find a theory of everything that will solve, solve the whole of everything, will solve the, the neuroscientists like obsessed with solving the hard problem of consciousness itself, all within a materialist kind of gaze. We see this over the last couple weeks of this obsession with what's going on with AI and all of the, <laughs> we're going to get it. We're going to get it. We just need a better cognitive model to, to help us solve all these problems. And then the other piece of that is of course rationality, the way that we approach this. And I would say even positivism that asserts that there is an objective truth that we can be in relationship with. And it kind of reifies and double downs on we are separate from rather than entangled with. So here's where we, we where we know that we are um, at kind of a, a thumbnail. And I didn't give it all. Yeah, I didn't give it all justice, but just to just offer that in. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, we were jumping over. Yeah. Uh, uh large swab of um, philosophical and kind of political economic history and maybe just to to center in again on like what because we're throwing words around like ontology so just as a reminder ontology is the way that we believe the world to be and um, so Lynn's walked us through kind of the way that enclosure breaks up people's relational fields in order to create workers and demonize uh, vagrancy to where that becomes like a sin under um, British colonial rule. And then that model gets exported. And maybe Lynn will talk a little bit more about um, the impact of that on the geopolitical global south, where indigenous learning systems are replaced with impoverished systems of schooling that are not funded very well and serve to just really create more replicators for uh, worldview and an ontology of world as machine. And so we're skipping over a lot here, but re really the the invitation is, uh, there's a great line that's like, I don't know who discovered water, but I can be certain that it wasn't the fish, um, right? Like the, the, the this worldview that we're talking about is really is the, the, the water that we're swimming in and the air that we breathe and um, it's spoken about a lot that, so I, I'm a Gen Z um, who's grown up, you know, on the internet and um, also within this kind of like nihilistic framework of like being told about climate crisis and many of my peers are, you know, in an opioid epidemic and tuning out. Um, so there's like a, a real like sense of nihilism in, in my generation's field right now and i guess 
where am I going with the nihilism? I, just to, to point out, it is the logical conclusion of seeing the world as machine, of destroying all of our relationships with the natural world, with one another, with the modern human, um, into this like mechanized function to where we're now sitting kind of at the end, the edge of the world. Um, I might also add that that nihilism in a way is kind of the, the inevitable logical outcome of this, this perception of a separate self. And if I could even get a little bit spiritual or mystical, that, that, that the kind of the, the egoic nature of that, that leads one into a nihilistic kind of place and kind of hangs out there. So, um, so what do we do or how do we be? And if you'll allow me just for a personal journey for a moment, um, let's see if another slide is, is nicer to go to. I'm not, or, can, yeah, there we go. Let's just hang out on this one for a moment. So um, I, as I mentioned in the beginning, I worked on the, the system of, of schooling for a very long time. And I knew even as I was working on how do you improve the quality of schooling for the poorest children, my heart was always torn. I was always really torn by feeling like on the one hand, I was serving the logic of something that was so damaging to the world. On the other hand, recognizing that this institution was what touched billions of children and youth and people's lives every moment of every day. And so I, I was like, how, how do I do this? You know, someone who's who's very involved in this conference, uh, conference, Manish Jane and I have been friends for many, many years. And so we would have these ongoing discussions and, um, and I kept seeing with the expansion of modern schooling to every last village, that's happened very recently over the last couple of decades. There was a, a, a technology of mind and a, a continuation of a colonization of mind and body that was so deep that was taking people out of other ways of knowing and being faster than what the culture could actually catch up with. And, um, and I, I endeavored to find some air within the space of schooling or even alternative education. There wasn't a lot in there. And I had the great honor to both read the work, of course, of Ivan Illich and Gustav Esteva and many others, and over the last couple of years of the last years of his life, I had the honor to work with um, and, and have Gustavo Esteva as someone who is in our accompaniment circle of this work that, that Elnor and Adam and I have been a part of. And, you know, Gustavo has this famous line that he said that it's not that we need alternative educations, we need alternatives to education. And so what is that? That for me is this gateway into post-capitalist learning. So um, we put up this, this slide of what we speak about of ontological shifts, but before we, we get into what we're invoking with, with ontological shifts, I just want to speak to why it is that I went from working on the how to get out of the logic of systems of exploitation and domination as replicated in the logic of, of modern schooling towards, you know, I kind of joke like I couldn't make any traction on schooling, so I took on capitalism. Like it's kind of an absurdity. <laughs> yes, <laughs> this was the gateway in. Um, and so what we we speak to post-capitalism, and just I want to speak to what we're invoking with this. Um, first of all, we recognize that capitalism is much, 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 much more than just the, the market exchange. It's the commodification of everything. It's the commodification of to the deepest level. Um, and I'm not going to go into that just for the sake of time, but I think we all here who are sitting here recognize, like, as we just set up the logics of neoliberalism and the water we're swimming in, what we're evoking with capitalism. Including its colonial antecedents. Exactly. Yeah, the project of coloniality and white supremacy and everything that gave rise to this latest chapter of capitalism and neoliberalism. So when we're invoking um, post-capitalism, we don't put a dash in there. What we're trying to speak to is that we need a way in that is informed by um, capitalism itself. So we rec we need to be good students of history. And yet we need to also not just stay in the critique. Like we need to not just stay in being good students of history and having historical analysis. Post-capitalism is a provocation 
to open up to a pl plurality of what one could call values. I, I perhaps would offer like states of being that is an ongoing praxis. It's an ongoing way that we need to keep working to, to find ourselves in. And so when we're invoking this, we're speaking to values and, and thought forms and ways of being around um, solidarity, kinship, cooperation, intervenedness, interconnectedness, nonviolence, empathy, reciprocity, beauty. And we may have time to get into that sometimes we, we speak to these values and we see them in a continuum of like almost that there's a tension of where we find ourselves in innerly and in our outer systems and structures and what we're invoking with these post-capitalist values and ways. And that where I feel it within myself, why I put this slide up is that this excess is that place in the middle that's getting out of pyramid logics and is moving towards what we'll, we'll offer of kind of spiral logics, ways of, of from the cosmology moving into recognizing that we are entangled in webs of relationships, that that place lives within in us, these, these cosmological friction points. And this for me is this gateway into post-capitalist learning. Mm -hmm. That's an ever ongoing praxis, like moment by moment that we can apply, if you will, within ourselves, within our relations, within the way that I pick up this cup of water, within the way that I move in my institution, the way that I move within my vocation, the way that I'm responding to this moment of the meta crisis. Um, yeah. Recognizing that uh, there likely won't be another doubling of the economy, that, you know, as much as this isn't just another ism to suggest like what comes after that we that we are at a transition point and so what what ways could we steer what would be the transition pathways what are the values that we would want to inculcate um what Adam just offered is a really important piece of what we're we're working with we're not trying to set up yet another binary of old culture and new culture. So post-capitalist learning is not, it's not such a temporal state. It's really working with the pluralities and the many ways of knowing and being that exist simultaneously. And so we're not trying to be in that binary logic, like let's get rid of what is bad and go to what is good. It's, it's actually like doing the hard work for something to arise within us that, that a post-capitalist, that a parallel adjacent future, that that some sort of ancient emerging might co-arise. And that's also to honor that even as we speak to the meta crisis, the poly crisis, the collapse, the quote unquote, this fixation on the apocalypse, the end of the world that we know it, to recognize that for, for many, many, many multitudes of peoples who've been walking this earth with uh, intact ways, um, their, their reality, They've been living this post-capitalist reality for hundreds of years since first contact, since their way of, of living in the world was eradicated and erased and, um, and murdered, mm -hmm. quite honestly. And also to honor that there are those who are living these kinds of post-capitalist realities right now. We take a, a lot of inspiration and honoring and not with a gaze of exotification, but in the gaze of, of, of deep humility and listening to like the movements in, in Rojava and the Zapatistas. There's a community in, in, San, in Colombia, San Jose de Bartado, that have been living these other ways of knowing and being, living other ways of kinship right here, right now. Mm -hmm. Especially as we strive towards scalable solutions. It's like maybe, maybe the way that we got here was through thinking in that way and perhaps they're as part of the problem maybe maybe part of the crisis is our approach to the crisis um and so just recognizing um what right relationship might look like and i'm really sitting with that before jumping to the urgency to act 
Um, so we invoke this notion of, of onto shifts as, um, let's see, let me back up a step. Our beloved brother, who I, I believe may be part of this, this conference as well, um, Bio Komalafe said this great line to us when we were doing some of this research that justice um, will get us a seat at the table, but it will never allow us to leave the house of modernity. So we take this as a provocation of what is it that's actually gonna allow us to leave the house of modernity? And here I take great inspiration from the work of Vanessa Andreotti and that beautiful book that she wrote, Hospice and Modernity, and the, and the, the incredible work that she and others do through the gesturing towards um, decolonial futures, the, the collective, and really recognizing the sickness of where we all are, are in within the, the project colonization of the house of modernity and, and this gateway of opening to post-capitalist learnings, post-capitalist modalities that might get us to some place of what is it to live post-capitalist realities. So one way that we felt that we could um, offer a way into this is through um, saying this shift towards pyramid logic, towards spiral logic, is having Adam, who's been swimming with us in, in many different ways of knowing and being, offer kind of what we mean by spiral logic and offer a couple of examples of what he's actually engaged in, what I might, all, I might call applied practice of ontological shifts. This one. Go to that. Yeah, that one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So maybe maybe a little bit of background, uh, kind of ecological despair. Um, I first became really disillusioned with the project of education while studying philosophy um, at the University of Cape Town and. And I, I want to say that, like, in the critique of <clears throat> materialist rationalism, we're, we're not suggesting an irrational approach to uh, sense making. Like, um, rationality is a tool, and and really the the poison that we're speaking to is is the the assumption that um, rationality can provide capital T truth and. Um, it's ignore, ignorance of context. So like Lynn spoke to this hilarious situation where everybody's really afraid of AI becoming conscious <clears throat> because we're measuring it, a computational algorithm according to a computational metric for consciousness, which is very blatantly uh, circular logic, but no one seems to grok that. Um, yeah, so it's just in, my own experience um, of studying philosophy and came to this point of like meaninglessness and, and, and nihilism and really like uh, solipsism where, um, you know, it was just me against the world and then watching, um, like I have to go into this thing and make a job for myself so I can earn these points so that I can pay back the debt because I've learned about this stuff. And every day I'm being told that, you know, the world is burning, another species is going extinct. Um, and so really like what to do in this situation, it kind of felt like um, perhaps the best thing for me to do in this context is to just remove myself from the equation because I'm only, I'm participating in an ongoing extractive destruction. And there doesn't really seem to be a way out or much point to, to doing this. Um, the light at the end of the tunnel for me was uh, Epicureanism, which was speaking about these kinds of communal ways of living. And to kind of cut to the chase of how I ended up in this work is finding myself in an intentional community, um, planting banana trees. Um, <laughs> And thinking he was going to be here for two weeks. Uh, yeah, I, pla I, pl I plan to come to Costa Rica to, to, to plant banana trees for three weeks as a break from the programming job that I was working. And um, 
and slowly just finding resonance with all the ideas that I had been gestating within myself that were not being taught in the learning environment I was in, in uh, kind of the Western philosophical tradition, um, where it's a logical conclusion that it's better to never have been born. This is a famous book by the ethicist, the leading ethicist at the, the school that I was studying. It's this kind of point of view of antinatalism. And if it sounds ridiculous, it's because it is. Um, but so at no point was there ever an invitation in that study to say, if this is a logical outcome, maybe the very underpinnings of our logic serve to be questioned. Um, that that this focused hyperfixation on identity and separation of self and other is perhaps the root of this ridiculous conclusion. Um, and so, yeah, I, I would say like I've been in kind of a two and a half year process of unlearning more than um, more than learning new things. It's been a process of uncovering um, my own biases and ways of thinking in order to allow for other information to actually come in. Um, and so this has involved uh, partially uh, becoming a student of culture. For others, it's, uh, you know, doing permaculture work or, or, or getting in contact with uh, in a way that's more than just um, um, going for a trail run or, or, or using the natural world as, as another place to have an experience. Store on mine. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought, I thought we got cut off by jungle Wi Fi. Um, <clears throat> and so that led me to helping Lynn and Elnor edit their work um, in a really unfamiliar space of philanthropy, um, which kind of looks at um, the ways in which we try to remedy the situation that we've created. And, and it's. Uh, very funny. I mean, I, I don't know how much to talk about philanthropy in this moment. Yeah, me too. Um, <laughs> but but so so a big part of that project was was unpacking the our neoliberal context and the precedents that came before it. Um, and then I have also been part of a fellowship with Culture Hack Labs, um, which is called the Rhizome Fellowship where we take a specific part of the ideology that we're swimming in and and try to understand it try to understand what its core messaging is try to see where it plays out in society and then and then learn to hack those narratives looking at the the deep mimetic narrative structure the very very living thought form of the ideas that swim within Culture with the provocation that these are alive. We need to move from those that are um, set up as binaries towards those that are what we call centropic framing, those that are in accordance with life. So this would be like uh, an example of this would be like the keen uh, desire for economists to fixate on this idea of like survival of the fittest as the prime evolutionary directive versus a lot of evidence that uh, symbiosis and syntropy actually has a far larger role to play in ecological systems, but because it serves the logic of a competitive environment of war and uh, game theory, um, we perpetuate these memes. Um, and then seeing the way that that plays out, in my case, specifically um, in economic dynamics and, and then the logic of that ultimately leading to ever and ever more extraction, ever and ever more hoarding. Um, and then this idea that like we will just invent the solutions, even though the very metric by which we will create those solutions is how we created the problems in the first place. So any kind of technological fix um, typically comes with this 
with this bias towards like, oh, no, don't worry about it. We will just keep mining more lithium and then slowly electrify the car fleet. And don't worry, you can just keep consuming at the same rate as you always were. Um, and this is not to say, again, that like science is bad or um, electric cars are bad or anything like that. It's just to recognize like, how did we get to the place where we're so blind that we're causing the very problems which we're trying to solve at the same time while being addiction addicted to solutionaryism and a very linear problem solution kind of a i would say obsession with certainty and knowing right like a, like a, 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 a transition a transition is not people in the global north driving electric suvs while people in the geopolitical global south uh suffer from crop annihilation due to climate change and um lithium mining and all of the rest of it i'm just mindful of our time so maybe we just kind of speak to the spiral uh, logic yeah. just a little bit and then we might have a moment to just kind of sit with a couple of the continuums and then we'll open it up sure yeah so so yeah so at the center of the spiral is cosmology so our ideas about the way that the world are inform the rest of the way that our society functions uh, uh, so this would be uh, we talk about the interaction between ontology epistemology and ethics so basically just to say you you only epistemology is like the study of truth right so the things that we think we know and why we think we know them and, and our ethics our intra action the way we approach what we think we know and how we see reality itself are are inextricably linked and bound up with you, the yeah world. you you can't you can't have uh, an idea of what is true without first having an idea of what it is what it means to be and the nature of reality so if you think that everything is the world is a machine that can be broken up into component parts and that imposes a set of truths that we see in the world and then similarly it in, it informs your ethics right so if you are living in the times of colonial europe and you believe that people who are non-white are not human and that humans are the only people deserving of ethical the, the only beings deserving of ethical interaction then it allows you to behave in certain ways so at the center of cosmology is really this interplay between ethics ontology and epistemology and so this informs um the way that we interact with one another in this kind of web of relational entanglements where i'm pitted against my neighbor and this is reinforced by processes of uh, claiming of the commons for first the serfs and the kings and then eventually capital but really just power structures taking taking the agency of communities away so that we become ever more and more individualized and then as a result of our relationship with each other our institutions are formed along similar lines which the institutions eventually build up to become sectors so sectors of education sectors of farming, uh, mining, politics, what have you. Um, I actually can't see. Um, and then the the economic framework that's also built on the same on the same logics serves as like the point of interaction for all of these sectors. Um, and and so there's this idea in kind of uh, um, postmodern thought, uh, kind of, I think Baudrillard was the, the, the person who said it clearest, but basically he talks about um, when our map for reality um, becomes clearer to us than reality, then it's reality that suffers. So what happens is we fixate on this model of the way that society works, the way that the economy functions as the capital T truth, and we forget that this entire hallucination is embedded within the planetary ecology and the emergent wisdom of Gaia itself. And Gaia itself lives within a vastly complex expanding emergent universe. 
Um, yeah, so just to situate where our ontology sits. <laughs> and so just to, to offer a, a couple last pieces on this before we, we open it up. So our provocation here is a way into what we're speaking to, this interconnected, interbeing way of, of, of relearning and, and living. Um, notions of kinship and reciprocity and interconnectedness. So rather than me perceiving myself as a separate Lynn entity, what if I start to recognize that I am like what we, we start to know about the gut biome and all of this and like, who's actually driving this bus? It could be the, the mitochondria that's in my, that's in my gut that, that I get from the soil that we're, we're trying to say rather than the individual that we see ourselves as a web of entangled relationships. That we, when we talk about memetics, this like thought form, these are also like communicable. Like you can think of them as like that they are bouncing around in and among us that are that are bringing us into this web of relationships. And rather than seeing communities and institutions as static institutions in the new liberal logic, that they are social ecologies, that, that we recognize the, the, the watersheds where we live, the forest that surrounds us, this web of relationals that's giving rise to where our organizations may exist, and that those, that those are embedded within biomes and bioregional, and that those ecologies are speaking to one another, embedded within the superstructure of the mycelial of, of that, that biome embedded within the sky and IntelliKey, embedded within this ever expanding universe. So this is a provocation towards finding how do we move into a, another logical way spiraling in. And as it says at the bottom, this is multi-directional, reflexive, discursive, um, non-linear and interconnected. This is a way to try to sit with as as Donna Haraway would say, staying with the trouble, to to find our way out of the, the ongoing domination of pyramid logic into another another way, which we would offer back to those values or ways of being that I said, this is one way to respond to post-capitalist learning. Uh, a funny thing about it is even the system that we're problem problematizing behaves in that discursive manner. So we're not suggesting that there's like a group of 12 angry men who are like pulling the strings <laughs> of capitalist modernity. And if we just like, unseated those people or something. The, the reality is in a way far more scary that these are communicable ideas that are reinforced by that ecology and sort of just a different way of perceiving them in order to perhaps perceive something else. So maybe just to, to offer a last piece as a jumping point into listening to what questions you might have or, or what comes is we spoke in the beginning about the, the neoliberal logic. I spoke to separation and lovely. Um, spelling yeah, that's great. I'm dyslexic. So, you know, I catch these things after the fact. <laughs> um, materialism, positivism to this, this, this continuum. And they're not, they're not just a, a, a binary again, into the non-dual, into the transcendent of the perception of subject object, into recognizing duality as a to both and. And both and that animate that we're living in a in a in a ever responding call and response world into the querying itself. Like what would happen if I actually looked at the the water that I'm going to sip and actually was in relationship with that water that it's carrying information from the dinosaurs to the ancestors to the lands that the rain fell upon into me and or if that's too much of a stretch to even see the webs of relationships of how that water even got to me and what was it by which that it, it came? What's the watershed? What's the piping? Whose hands touched it? What's that way that I can start to perceive this web of relationships in, of every piece of aliveness that I am engaging in? And another one, just because we're speaking about the reimagining education is, you know, moving from, I would almost say bureaucracy or efficiency into beauty and what that can bring forth within us. Nature, like one of the provocations that we have, and maybe I'll just, um, I'll, I'll, I'll speak to this, but, you know, there's a way in which when we sit with, um, with the, with nature, 
ourselves as nature, the more than living world is nature. There's this principle of beauty that seems to be the principle of, of continuing the, the continuum of life and death. And yet we're so trapped into, you know, the other day I was speaking to somebody and again, the, the thing of my, the most precious resource I have is my time rather than actually there's a way that we're trying to recultivate our relationship with life force itself. And in that, I'll say that we're moving from this, this we're working with this continuum of monoculture into polyculture, many ways of knowing and being. And I just wanted to, um, probably get to this in the discussion, but um, one of the things that we offer is uh, what is it that we're invoking around these transition pathways of this gateway of, of post-capitalist learning into many ways of being and knowing? And this we developed because, again, we were looking to philanthropy and the NGO industrial complex. And the reason I put this slide up here now is that at the center of what we call this five element mandala, which is our subjective view of what might be ways that we respond and that we, we work towards post-capitalist realities to come into the material realm, to come into our mimetic structures, that come into our very way of being. The center of all of this is, is the element of ether. And here we're speaking to the recultivation of life force. And so this is where we are we're explicitly calling for the resurgence of initiation ceremonies and what in the, the Western tradition and the Occidental mind might call mystery schools, other ways of being and knowing. It's a recognition that we need to work on trauma, but not through the, 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 the lens of modernity of let's work on our trauma so we become better citizens to mature modernity itself and a transactional relationship, but that we need to acknowledge and work on this both for the ancestral lineage that live in us in our epigenetics, and also to see the gift in that and the wound that brings us back into the entanglement with life. Perhaps some of our healing is because of the system that we find ourselves in, as it was for me. Um, <clears throat> And maybe we'll get to this provocation when we, we speak that I'm in it or, or when we discuss that. Just listen to all of you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to whatever came through this offering um, today. So maybe we just open it up if there's any questions questions, um, any reflections. Um, we could also just kind of sit in silence for a moment and feel ourselves kind of working in what's coming, what's, what's, you feel numbed out, worded out. <laughs> yeah, it's alive here now. And I can't see the chat with my older eyes, so <laughs> I'll, I'll take a little peek in there. Hmm. I'm just wondering, would it be possible to make this presentation available? I, I think it's being recorded. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the slides, the or PowerPoint or whatever presentation it is, the, the full thing. And we, we, we borrowed those from or took those from the book that we did, which is available for free as a downloadable PDF as well. And we have a beautiful Pan-African publisher, Diraja Press, that we work with, who um, elevates many of the Pan-African ideas. So we offer it for free or by donation because it supports their voices as well. Beautiful. Where would we find this? We'll put the link in here. But if you Google post capitalist philanthropy, mm -hmm. not that much that's been written about it, you'll find it. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much uh, for the presentation. Uh, that was a uh, quite. Um, you know, intriguing and uh, really fascinating. Uh, my, my question is, um, uh, I, I want you to know, like, this kind of a uh, thought system, like, I, I don't, like, in what kind of uh, 
environment or what kind of uh, society or what kind of uh, maybe country, you know, are this kind of thought system prevalent? Because uh, over my lifetime, you know, it's 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 you know, it's not really popular to wake up a day and you know hear perspective like this. You know, it's the modernist, you know, conventional way of uh, thinking of doing things based on competition. Uh, you know, that you hear. So, you know, perhaps in the future, I can think about, you know, making a visit, vacation, or, you know, going on some extra tra training and learning. So the kind of uh, environment where, you know, these kind of initiatives are popular. Yeah, thank you. Mm, thank you. Yeah, we have... Um... You know, Adam called this place uh, intentional community and noticed that I contracted because I, I feel like that's a particular mimetic structure and way of interacting. I would say we're very much in, we would call it almost an experiment and not clinical, but recognize that we're both in tech, you know, like we have this computer that we're here with the Zoom call electricity to run it. And if to live post-capitalist realities and what is it to, to call those forth? And um, you know, you can we're we're sitting at a place called Tierra Valiente or Brave Earth. Bookman, we have different gatherings here. Find how to reach out to us through this piece. You know, for we're here, we're already entangled. So we listen for what's the ripeness with that as well. And that being said, like there are also multitudes of responses to to the crisis that we face ourselves with, and and no one set of ideas is going to fit everywhere. Um, so I'm curious where where you are in the world, um, because I don't I don't think that there is like a, the fun thing about this crisis is that it's, is that it's everywhere. So um, <laughs> there, I, I'm sure that there will be movers and thinkers and people living in alternatives. Um, of where you are, do you know anybody? In that area. Point you in the direction mm -hmm. of. Yeah. <clears throat> I saw that um, Devin also had a, had a hand up. Yeah, thank you um, both for creating this space, this discussion. It's really, really powerful and, and just beautiful to be here, like at this conference and in this conversation. I feel like I've been alone with a lot of these thoughts for two years, like trying to find people to talk about them with, and people just don't have any idea what I'm talking about, or they're like, sort of know what I'm talking about, but not too interested in taking action. And um, and I know that my desire to take action is, you know, I think part of the problem and my solutions and like, how do we scale this? And how do we, how do we change things is, you know, I think still like part of the problem. Um, and then I also have this, I feel like in me, there's this tension between like um, recognizing that my solutionality or my addiction to solution based thinking is part of the problem and also recognizing Mm -hmm. There is like an urgency for many people right now. There's so much suffering happening in the world. And I have lost sort of faith with the idea that like this kind of work could be like taught to a bunch of teachers mm -hmm. and that, like they would effectively be able to pass it on. But I, mm -hmm. I've been thinking a lot about how, you know, finding ways to like share this that circumvent sort of traditional teaching establishments and like just like making this kind of discussion and space and inquiry available to young people, I feel like it could have such a powerful impact. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sort of curious your thoughts on that because it feels like very, you know, sort of solution focus, like how do we scale this? But it also seems like it could be very impactful and, um, and beneficial. I love that you're bringing this up. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, it's really interesting for me is as Elnor and I and Adam were doing and having lots of conversations with people to to map out you know what is post capitalist realities what is the terrain what is cosmology I was noticing people were talking about you know bio regional food water cultural sovereignty looking at all of these and I kept saying like what about what's going on with the schooling what about this whole thing that happens for Billions of children and youth every single day when they to adults, we talk about de-schooling work. And I was like, why is people in our 
our psychology or our our gaze itself that it completely falls outside mm -hmm. and so, um invitation and what you're speaking to and um and i don't know what to say and other than i'm with you i'm with you in it and um i've long i kind of did this piece on as i said like post-capitalism and working on philanthropy but the question that beats my heart that beats my soul is what is the education for our times and this post-capitalist learning for me is the is one of these ways and it doesn't it can happen anywhere right it is a way that we're we're working with these inner states of being in this praxis that can be practiced any moment any any time and so how do we bring forth this, um, not just this content, but this content coupled with these praxis. And so, I don't know, reach out, let's, let's dream together. <laughs> yeah. Just recognizing we have one minute, mm -hmm. so maybe just do one quick Olga. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if this is an answer to anything, but like I was, I'm, I, I, I'm in academia myself and I also don't know what to do with myself and whether I should even be here, but like, I made a new friend recently and she shares some of all the concerns that were articulated here and she has worked as a tutor and she was saying how like what she ended up acting out just that's what came to her was just sort of listen to the children because she noticed that children just and I remember this from myself like when I was taught like science I found myself like I don't know, like, whatever, let me not speak about myself, but she noticed that, 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 that children would get, say, distracted or like they would not be paying attention. They would just did, weren't so interested or whatever. So she asked, like, what are you, where's your mind? Like, what, what are you thinking about? And you're not sort of like paying attention to this. And the, the kind of response that she would very often get was like, where does my grandmother go? Like, where did she go when she disappeared? Like, because of whatever, she, he lost his grandmother or whatever, the little kid or like, and they were talking about this very deep things like death and life and like, where are we? And 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 she was like, yeah, I just ended up spending time on these, these issues instead, which I think are super relevant, even in the conversation that we're having right now about like, how do we, how do we go ahead? And like, where is this progress taking us? And like, I don't know, maybe just the one 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 way to deal with all this in education, just sort of just listen and, and like ask ask people what their concern is. I don't know. I just thought I would throw that out. I thought it was a nice kind of anecdote. It's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Um yeah, I just want to, since we are at time and honor that the this gift of Kronos and Kairos time, say again and the uh, the gratitude for your presence and for your listening and for whatever entanglement and inquiries we're holding in. And um, this is a deep inner and intra and interconnected and cultural, you know, if we really take into this spiral logic and this provocation of some of these onto shifts, this gateway again into post-capitalist learning, this is the work of our times as I see it. And um, this is the work, as I was saying, that can come anywhere that we are in each moment. And um, I really appreciate that those of you who are continuing to work within the house of modernity, within the institutions of schooling, and who are sitting at the, I could say, cosmological friction point between the logics of where we are in neoliberalism and opening up to what we're opening, this provocation of kinship, of solidarity, of nonviolence, of cooperation, of interbeingness and interconnectedness. And um, I think Adam put a few things in terms of where you can find the book, a way that you can be in contact with us. Um, we're really terrible about social media. Maybe the Gen Zer will get the Gen Xer to do better about that. But um, we'll probably do a, a, a online course with service space in the coming months to go into this provocation of post-capitalist realities. And so we'll find a way to actually put that up on the world. So if you find transition resource circle as well, maybe put that URL and you can you can stay in touch. And I look forward to finding what we all are co-dreaming. And um, may your day be blessed with mystery and emergence. <laughs>